Perfect. All right, guys. So as you probably already saw from this cadaver, uh, there are some challenges that confront us. Um, you can see the significant spondylosis throughout the spine. Um, so what I'm just going to do is I'm, I'm just picking the right T12 pedicle here. Um, you can see the ribs. Uh, and then you can see the compressed L1 vertebra itself with its horizontal transverse processes. So what I've done is I've taken a straight radio opaque marker, which it can be a straw tunneling tool for your ICS systems. And I've drawn a line uh, from the, the center of the right T12 pedicle through the interlaminar space, OK? And so um, I'll take Jody, my hand into that chewy. Sorry, man. So basically, the two points here to consider are here and here, OK? So that's why I'm drawing this line. And then what I'll do is, thank you, sir. I'll just draw a line. I strongly encourage everybody to mark your patients up, especially when it comes to DRG, but certainly do so for your SCS, okay? Now, it looks like there is an IOBAN on this patient. Oops, you can take off the timer on the C-arm. Is our machine having a, a tantrum? <laughs> Dr. Stacy overheated it. Perfect. <laughs> All right, so uh, I've marked out my entry point here. And of course, we'd anesthetize. And if we were doing the full on implant, I would actually make a one centimeter incision. The incision for this is not significant. In fact, why don't we go ahead and do it because I'm going to end up putting a battery in. I'll take a knife of any kind that has sharpness. Perfect. And I actually like to follow Langer's line, so I actually do a horizontal cut. And then I will bovie down so that I can create a little bit of a pocket for the lead itself. We'll get this through. This patient, I'm, in, I'm assuming, is quite slim, just based on what I'm seeing here. So that's what's sort of determining the skin entry point, whether I'm staying close or staying further back. It is quite calcified. There's no question about that, as Dr. Stacy was going through. So I'm going to walk off. See if we can get this in. So can you just describe where you are and how you and what, what you touched and felt? Yeah, so I hit lamina, what I presume is lamina, because this would be a quite a calcified ligament. I am just coring through. So I am using this straight chewy and I'm just rotating around just to get through those calcific points. So That's very nice through. muscle flexing, by the way. And I'm increasing the steepness of the angle and just seeing if I can get down. It is really calcified as we learned already from the SCS. I like my trajectory. It's just a matter of getting this guy to drop in. So what I'm going to do is actually restyle it. Let's see if that did it. Is that the current image we're seeing in this room? And I'm going to take a guide wire just to check. So that was completely calcified, guys. I had to use a little bit more force. One of the things I joke about is that I'm a geriatric pain physician, so I'm used to kind of dealing with more calcific spines like this. So this, is, this was Mike's question, when do you use loss to lead? So this is one of those situations because... So you're reverting to the two hands twisting technique. Well described. I think that will do it. So I'm a little bit further across the midline than I'd like. Okay, so ideally, yeah. needle entry into the epidural space would be right at the midline. But we have what we have, and we'll see how this works. So this, what I'm doing now is, as you can probably see, I am advancing the sheath into the needle itself. 
And the radio opaque tip of the sheath is that dark band at the very top. Under live, I'm going to align them. I'm going to tighten this up as tight as I can. And All right. And then what I'm going to do now is, can we collimate over that right T12 pedicle so my hand doesn't get arthritic? In the so mix? can you just quickly say what the disadvantage of having gone a little bit past the midline is going to be? Yeah, so circle collimation, please. So because I'm a little bit past the midline, I'm going to have no problem getting to that DRG. The issue is going to be making those tension relief loops. I'm now with a workspace that is probably 67% of what I would have otherwise had. And then Ryan, uh, periscope towards you and then north. Just just have the T12 pedicle right in the middle of your picture. <coughs> and so I, it'll be a little bit more of a challenge, Brett, but I think I'll be able to accomplish it in this situation. And then you That's can because you're experienced. Just a little bit further. And we're obliquing towards him because this patient has a rotatory scoliosis. <clears throat> All right, so now I am just going to excavate the epidural space, so to speak, and I'm slowly rotating uh, more laterally. Um, as you can probably imagine, there are going to be a lot of osteophytes that are going to prevent me from going out. So Joe, what I'm going to do is get us a, a guide wire into the sheath because this is going to be a fun time. This is not so a good Joe is my case. homeboy and Abbott rep. Who, uh, we've done a lot of these cases together. So what we're doing is instead of putting the lead through the sheath, we're actually taking the guide wire. It provides us a little bit more rigidity, uh, and that'll allow us to hopefully get out of this foramen, which is clearly ossified. So let's take a look here. <clears throat> Just a little bit more. Of course, now I have issues in the space. Okay. So I'm going to just keep on working my way out. So now I'm kind of knocking on the door of the foramen. It is really tough. I can already feel. It's heading a nice so direction. I'm just kind of jabbing away at the foramen, just trying to get it out. <clears throat> and hopefully it gives here. So what are, you, what are you jabbing against? What are you poking against? These are those neuroforaminal ligaments that we were talking about. That's preventing the egress. And I'm just giving... These are, as you guys know from the neuroframen from the generation, there are going to be tons of osteophytes in this foramen. That's exactly what I'm feeling. It's like rock hard. And so I'm just kind of punching those in a way. So what does this feel like to the patient when you're doing this? Uh, not fun. <laughs> so what kind of, do you use sedation for this case? No, I use my words, actually. One of the things you don't want to do is over sedate <clears throat> and have your neuromonitor go away. So what I'm doing right now is not really stimulating. It's the moment this actually gives way that's really stimulating for the patient, but it's transient. So you just warn them of that. So now what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to poke the stylet through, which I just did, and now see if I can advance the guide wire, or excuse me, the sheath with it. The issue is the sheath is, has a wire, wider diameter than the actual guide wire. So we will continue to have fun with this. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. David, for giving us this cadaver. Perfect. We're getting there. One of the things that you know some people may say is like, well, why don't we put a lead right through and see if it'll push out? Problem is it just doesn't have the rigidity that's compared to this guide wire. So we're making some movement. We're getting a millimeter at a time. And I'm just twisting my sheath, trying to just keep it as dorsal as possible. But I'll tell you guys, it is a brick wall. There is, <clears throat> this is like beyond what you even see. The stylet all the way in, perfect. We got some kinkage. 
So one thing different about this versus doing spinal cord simulation is we can always access a different level of spinal cord simulation or, or to go from the other side and move the lead over. You can't do that here. <laughs> if you want to get this DRG, this is the way you've got to get in, which is why the preoperative screening of the patient is really important to make sure it's accessible where you think you need to be. Um, and our preoperative screening was none. We, we basically <laughs> were given a cadaver we knew nothing about, right? And you're seeing that it isn't always so easy. So just like anything we do in this field, always have a plan B, C, D. So what we're going to do is use a shallow curve. With that, that shallow curve, um, let's see, which camera am I looking at? Where's the camera? Ah, there we are. Um, Joe will show you here. The shallow curve has a little bit less of a curve. And so the advantage to that is that when we're trying to drive through all that uh, osteophytic fibrotic tissue, it's not going to bend as much with the shallow curve in comparison. So um, we're going to give this a go. The drawback here, though, is that my ability to use tension relief loops is mitigated. So we'll get that lined up perfectly here. And so if you can't get in here, would you think about going the, the DRG above? Yeah. But I'm pretty sure this is going to be the same issue at every level. But that is always a consideration because there is convergence and divergence that it's really looking back. And there's quite a bit of that actually. Where um, there we go. I don't think we're there yet. That, that feel promising to you? That's a little bit better. Okay. We might take that. Now it's going to get interesting. So I might be able to get that lead right where I want, but now my tension relief loops are going to be even more challenging. So remember the DRG is in here. And that's where we want. You want, to, you want the last contact to be there. So let's take a lateral here. So basically what we're doing is we're getting the second and third contacts. I don't know if anyone can see me. The second and third contacts underneath the pedicle, um, which is basically how we have it. We're going to check a lateral and make sure the contacts are not <coughs> heading ventral to the posterior border of the vertebral body itself. Um, sometimes it's just going to take the path of least resistance, and so we might see that. But then what we could always do is have our Abbott representative program, stimulate, and ensure that we're not getting motor stimulation. So perfect, we're right at that posterior border, we would take this. And as you can see, we're getting a little bit of a cheerio, that hollow contact at the end. We can come back around to AP. So at this point, what I do is I bring everything to the 12 o'clock position with my flush port and my bevel. I take out the stylet, which is about four inches. So now I'm turning that capellini from uncooked pasta to cooked pasta, okay? So now I'm going to bring my sheep back, which is that dark band, and it has to traverse through all of that calcific material. So I'm bringing it back slow, more slowly than I want, but that's because of the sheep right there. And then what I'm doing is I'm advancing lead. Now it's it's not ideal; it should be hugging the pedicle a little bit better, but it's going to start to cross over just because there's I'm sure hypertrophy of that facet joint. So I'm actually going to take that cephalad. Otherwise, I'm worried that lead's going to pull out. And I'm going to now advance. We're making the best of the situation, quite frankly. I'm going to try to make this caudal loop. And it doesn't matter how big the loops are. The key thing here is to have as many inflection points as possible. I don't love how that just kind of yeah. sagged, yeah. but again, with the osteophytes and the large facet joint, that might be the best we get. This is kind of why it's nice to have your first patient be a 30-year-old with CRPS. Yeah, but we're doing it, you know? We're yeah. Gonna, we're going to get it. It's not your first patient. <laughs> We'll just kind of play back and forth. We'll write Dr. Beal's name in here. 
So we don't want too many crossovers, um, quite frankly, for this particular <laughs> cadaver. Uh, the sacrifices we made, this is probably what I'd stick with. Um, just because it's, it's really hard to make that cephalad loop. Well, I could spend more time trying to excavate that area after taking all this out. But what you get here is a good idea of, of how we try to make that cephalad loop, how we make that caudal loop, and all that has to do with the rotation of the sheath, the needle bevel, all working in concert. And it's, it's pretty clear that that last contact is probably a little more lateral than it needs to be. So if it pulls in a little bit, you got some space, right? Correct. All right, so now what I'm going to do is uh, move on to the implantation of the IPG. Uh, is there a clock in here? Yes, I think I have like 10 minutes to do this. So I'm just going to leave this lead in place, and what I'm doing is I'm removing the needle sheath complex. I'm going to grab the lead down below. And, you know, IPG placement and positioning is extremely important. Obviously, with these cadavers, uh, we're not asking the patients where do you want it and actually drawing on them, but please make sure you mark out in pre-op where exactly that location is on the patients um, because it's super important as far as <clears throat> their comfort level and it may be the reason your spinal cord stimulator fails. It may have nothing to do with pain relief. All right, so because we didn't talk to our patient in pre-op, uh, I'm just going to arbitrarily choose a location and usually what I use is a ruler of some sort. I can just use the <coughs> knife handle. I can use the knife handle, or I can use this. Um, and do we have an IPG anywhere? Joe, do you have an IPG for me? Okay, he went to go run and get the IPG. Perfect. So the incision I make, guys, I, like I told you before, I try to make my incisions as small as possible. Um, I'm looking at this camera. So my incision is basically the length of the interface between the plastic and metal. Yep. That measures out to four centimeters, okay? Uh, let's focus, if you want to focus. And for most devices, that's between four and five centimeters. All right, so 11 to 15, you get a sense of that. Perfect. Um, you usually find the, the area with the most cushion, if you will. I follow Langer's lines, uh, which are basically uh, determined by a plastic surgeon from the 20th century who looked at how the skin wrinkles kind of came together. You can all do that in yourselves. And so if your incisions are parallel to it, the tissue healing will be superior, and so will the cosmetic appearance. So let's just arbitrarily draw this, you know, four, four and a half centimeter line. Of course, I'll anesthetize, and then I'll take a knife. Thank you, sir. Important to have <clears throat> your bovie ready to go. In this case, we won't have any electrocautery. Uh, also important to have a nice, firm incision. I've already excavated down. And then here you can either finger dissect after you do electrocautery, or it will take a male or a med. And this is another place to have more than one plan because everybody's, sometimes you can finger dissect extremely easily, other times your finger is not going through that tissue. People's tissues are, is, are quite different from each other. And you, if you always do, if you say I always do finger dissection, you're gonna find someone you can't do that on. And you have a template or now, it's okay. So we're just uh, lacking our equipment right now, but I'll just take what I got. I'll use this needle driver just to kind of open up some of the space while we run and get a Mets for us. So would you usually use scissors? But we're getting there. Thank you, sir, perfect. So I like the curves. So the key here is to insert closed and then open. Insert closed and then open as you pull back. And what you're doing is you're getting through the tissue without actually cutting any vessels or anything like that. That's what you want to avoid. Of course, you may have some bleeders here and there, and then you electrocauterize. So I've created a decent pocket. I'm just going to see if I can get this battery in. It's a little snug, but it will work eventually. Perfect. I feel a little tension right there. I think if I get that in, it will be good. So there you have it, if you can see. Battery's in. I usually do this step with a template, and then I leave the template in, and I will tunnel. Um, is this a tunnel I'm going to use? And what's the depth of that pocket? This one is only two centimeters, um, but I will generally go about three to four centimeters with the non-rechargeable systems. For rechargeable systems, you definitely don't want to uh, exceed two centimeters because the interface between your charging equipment and the IPG obviously needs to be as close to the as possible for recharging. You can potentially go a little deeper with the Medtronic system, but um, if you implant it too deep, they will not be able to charge, or their charge times will be really long, and they will not like you. 
So we're using different <coughs> kind of tunneling tools here, but uh, basically what I did is I went through my incision, one centimeter. I'm finding a plane in which it's basically uh, subcutaneous fat, so it, it should go very smoothly. And then once I get to this level here, make sure you don't stick your fingers in there, and you kind of just take a look and visualize, and then you'll see it come right out, okay? And then we'll unscrew all of this to get the straw out. And we'll take a debakey's if we have one. Do you have a debakes? No debakes? Just clamp. Okay. Sharp object back. Okay, and then you take your lead. This is true for SCS or DRG. Take it all the way through the straw itself. Make sure you see your contacts on the other end. Uh, I like to have a little loop here. And the reason I have this loop is because I'm gonna be able to make a little tension relief loop. Now notice, I don't know if you guys can see this with a camera, this loop, it has a certain way it wants to flop. That's a natural tendency. If you force it to do something else, well, what's gonna happen under the skin is it's gonna wanna do what it wants to do. So what I really recommend is that when you have that sort of loop and it wants to lay in that orientation, have it lay in that orientation. Don't force it another way because it may eventually make its way back out. So I created a little plane underneath and it's sitting right there. This would usually be the template, not my IPG. But we'll get it back out here before it starts to sink further and further away. <laughs> and <clears throat> do we have a screwdriver? This is not a Proclaim ERG IPG. So anyway, uh, this is an SES IPG, but what we usually do is obviously connect it, have our, our reps check impedances, and once they say everything looks good, close it down and then we're, we're set to go, bury it. And then we can talk about how we do some infection control, but I generally irrigate, uh, play some vancomycin powder, and then close. Excellent. So what, what problems do you, have, do you encounter during this step, this phase? What, what problems have I encountered? Yes. Um, I mean, probably the uh, biggest issue for me has been maybe there, you catch a bleeder. Um, the tunneling really shouldn't be painful. You know, I was always taught, oh, you know, give more sedation, it, it, you know, they could really move. Honestly, if you find the correct plane, it's really not an issue. If you're not in the right plane, if you're actually hitting muscle, if you're actually tugging tissue, you should stop and really understand where you're at and then re-find the right plane. Um, and then, of course, it's super important. When not, I don't anchor with DRG, as you all saw, because the anchoring really is in the tension relief loops. But with your spinal cord stimulator dorsal column leads, anchoring is of utmost importance. Whatever, the, whatever manufacturer you use, doesn't matter. Just make sure it's done super well. And I anchor down with 2 at the bond uh, just to make sure it's a and non-soluble. One, one thing I, I can comment on is that sometimes I, I put my incision basically over the center of the IPG, or maybe a little on the upper upper third, around the upper third. I've seen people put the incision only at the top and put the whole IPG in. Um, there's lots of different ways of doing that, but if you're going to be creating a pocket above and below your incision, you want to make sure those are on the same level. I've, I've definitely seen fellows say, the pocket's all ready, and I have things that do not line up, which is not going to work. So you need to make sure you... Uh, have, have a nice smooth plane that extends above and below the incision. Perfect. Any questions from the audience? Any questions? Comments? Deeper is more comfortable. Deeper is harder to charge. If it's not a rechargeable system, then go deep. That's correct. Uh, Deeper is way better for the patient. They will, I've had less issues with IPG irritation uh, with the four centimeter depth or three centimeter depth. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you.